just right into it. Crew show going on. We got my man Sunil, got my man Pat here. Welcome, welcome. Let's start. Top of the market, state of the market, 75 basis point increase. What are your thoughts? Well, I guess I, I could start off, Patrick, but um, you, you know, we'll see how the banks react. Uh, you know, I've been trying, I've been, my feelings have been pretty agnostic with the rate hikes um, just because, you know, really, how are the banks going to react? How are the commercial lenders going to react? Um, how far will our relationships go? So, you know, I'm not sure how much a lot of the banks have already baked in based on the initial conversation in the beginning of the year. So we'll just have to see, you know, we try to, I think something we teach and Patrick, you know, this is, is to not get too high or too low about what happens, you know, what kind of government policy comes into play um, because we can't do anything about it. So we just got to take the punches as it comes. And, uh, you know, we make adjustments to our underwriting and the deals we do um, based on what actually translates to the market. So we'll, we'll take it as it comes. I think a lot of folks have essentially been baking these interest rate hikes into their models. Anyway, yeah. if you're underwriting an apartment building, a strip mall development deal, I think if 75 basis points makes or breaks the deal, it probably wasn't a good deal to begin with. I agree. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's the, it's the, I think people get scared when they think of, you know, rate hikes by the fed, but generally that's just kind of the overnight borrow rate anyway. I mean, this doesn't directly, it sort of indirectly impacts the market, but kind of, you know, especially for like developers out there, I think I would rather have a high interest rate that I could lock in versus runaway inflation. I agree with that. I agree with that. You know, one of the problems we've had recently, which I don't think will last, is that we got hit with a rate hike and obscene construction cost due to commodities inflation, right? And thank God they've been coming down. It's been coming down. And I think we're starting to see that on the retail level of construction. But it is, if once construction normalizes, and it really should, um, we'll be fine from a development perspective. The rates we can work around, and that's something we can dive into regarding you know, the different kinds of financing you can get to make a deal work. But to your point, you know, if 75, 50, even 100 basis points kills a deal, it shouldn't have been a good deal to begin with, which is why one of the rule of thumbs we've always had is, have about 250 to 300 basis points as your spread yeah. uh, when you're underwriting a deal. And that's why we've been, we've been pretty picky about deals over the past uh, four or five years. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, obviously as developers, right, and investors, we kind of work and talk in this lingo all the time, but we also have our clients that we serve constantly. And uh, one of the big questions that comes up when we're helping folks kind of vet properties, especially, um, you know, newer investors, we ask them, what sort of returns are you after? What kind of debt are you going to get involved with here? And, you know, one of the biggest questions is what is a cash on cash return? Pat, you want to kind of give us a quick hot take on what a cash on cash return is for those who may not be well versed in the subject matter? Yeah, sure. So cash on cash, essentially, you know, when you're when you're leveraging a building, you're putting debt on a building or a property. Um, obviously, the bank and the mortgage, it's taking care of part of it. But then you also have the equity piece that you have to bring in. Right. So after you, you know, look at the income, after you take out the expenses, after you take out the leasing costs, if that's something that, you know, you're doing, um, any CapEx, any um, building reserves, that kind of that bottom line. Um, so your cumulative that, cost, your, your operating expenses. Your cumulative cost, your operating expenses. Once you take out, you know, once you pay the mortgage back, right, you have this cash flow after debt service. That cash flow after debt service, if you take your... Um, cash flow after debt service and you and you put it over the equity that you put in, that's basically your cash on cash um, uh, equation. That's your formula. So it's your cash, the cash you put in versus the cash you're going to take out. And it's the cash that you take out over the cash that you put in. That is your cash on cash. So essentially the money you put in is being put to work. You're going to have your operating expenses to manage and operate your building. Um, and whatever is left after you paid all your debt service and your expenses is essentially your cash on cash return. That's correct. Got it. Got it. Anything else that you think is pertinent on that subject? Or do you think we kind of buttoned it up? Well, I mean, I think according, you know, cash on cash is it's, it's, there are a lot of different kinds of investors, right? Like you have the developer, you have the guy, you know, the core investor, you have the value add, you have opportunistic, um, when we talk about returns, it's not so cut and dry, right? Cash on cash is 
that is for something that I think a lot of buy and hold investors look at. Um, you can also look at your IRR, your internal rate of return, which essentially takes this capital event at the end. It's either going to be a refi or it's going to be a sale, which helps your returns. But your IRR is based on the amount of time you're getting your money back, right? Um, and, and how quickly, right? If you have it more front loaded, you have generally a better IRR. If your money is coming at the end, your, your return isn't as great, right? Because it all has to do with time, right? But there are just so many different ways to look at it. If you're looking at it from a cap rate, a purely cap rate standpoint. So your percentage return on your investment. Your percentage return on your investment. That's sort of like, let's take time out of the equation. If you're looking at your IRR, you are looking at time. But if you're looking at cash, right? That's, you know, let's buy and hold. Let's collect cash every month, every year, you know, every decade. And we're not truly concerned about what that end product, that appreciation looks like. So makes sense. The, yeah. The investor is the investor is you have to speak to your investor, basically. And cash on cash is just one of the equations. Fair, fair. Actually, that brings me to one of the most important parts of that conversation. And Sunil, if you could chime in on this, there's different creative structures to financing a deal. And I think what a lot of folks who are new to real estate investing don't realize is that you can make or break a deal based on the complexity or um, the style of financing, right? For example, you have interest only. Um, you could maybe have a, a seller carry a second. Um, you can do a cash out financing after you've improved the property. If you want to touch on any of those, that'd be great. Um, you know, to touch a little bit on what Patrick said, if we'll segue into this is, you know, again, it really depends. The beauty of real estate is that you can approach it so many different ways, depending on your investor, uh, the goals of the developer, um, the goals of the whole team together. Um, I think location and type of project also factors into those decisions. You may be willing to take, and you probably will take a, a lower IRR, or cash on cash, or a cap rate that may be not as great um, as you could do in other areas, but you're exchanging that for an A-plus location, uh, a project that has an amazing walk score. Lower with, risk. Yeah, lower risk, trophy asset, uh, across from the metro or, or bus line. So there's so many other you know, non-quantifiable factors that you will take into account when you're underwriting a deal that you're not going to be able to put on a spreadsheet. So uh, that's a big part of it as well. And that's how you add value as a developer is to really highlight those, you know, variables and, and ensure that they're included in the equation properly. Um, and then into kind of the creative, and that also can lead you to like, what kind of financing you should get. So depending on the type of project, you may be looking at, you know, a standard bank, 70, 75, even 80 in the rest equity, uh, debt in the rest equity. So um, you, they're gonna they're gonna loan seventy five percent or eighty percent of the purchase price, correct. and you as a developer or investor are gonna bring 20, 25 percent. Yeah, that. usually yeah. between funds of our own and and funds we raise from either friends or family or some kind of a syndication, we'd come up with the equity piece. Uh, but there's also depending on what kind of project you're doing, DC for example, a lot of projects carry a affordable component, uh, some more than others. So you may be able to qualify for certain government grants or low income tax credit financing programs, um, certain kind of bond programs, uh, community. If your project's part of a comprehensive development plan, there are certain grants available that can help fund the project. So it's important as a developer to really know your area, know where you work and have a good feel for what the long-term outlook is, what the goals are for the city, uh, what your goals are, what the neighborhood goals are, and figure out the best way to, you know, approach the project uh, uh, smart uh, financially um, and find the best mechanism to make it work. So it's not as easy as, and, and especially as bigger projects get into, it's not as easy as just, oh, I'll just get the debt, I'll get the equity, and we'll do a great project. Uh, yeah, there's I mean, so many components to it. That's why you hear terms like debt stack, where you'll have multiple layers of investors, yeah. multiple layers of, of financing. Right. Right. Um, share with me, guys, when would you use an interest only product? Well, generally, an interest only product, well, 
where I've seen the interest only products and, and Chanel could probably, you know, expand on it is uh, not so much income at the moment, right? You are, you are taking down a building and you are adding that value. So maybe you are strapped for income based on just how much cash the building's thrown off. There's not enough rent coming from it. There's not Even enough. Even a vacant site or the construction on there's no yeah, income. Exactly. All, dirt. all of, all of these, yeah. all of these, you know, it, it's, it's, it's certainly, it helps the investor kind of keep cash in their pocket while they're doing what they need to do to add that value, right? But generally you want to refi after you kind of gotten the build into stabilization. Got so it. whether that's developing or that's, you know, leasing it up, whether that's, um, you know, adding new features to a building, right? Things that are actually going to bring it up to, you know, more value, make it more valuable. Um, then you're going to refi and kind of capture that cash from the bank. And then you kind of do the principal and interest. And, and, and just really, typically that interest only period is, is taken up front of the bank in the form of an escrow. Um, so you would include that in your raise and your equity raise. So you would just bake it into the cost of the project from the beginning. Um, and then, you know, the bank, so you wouldn't be paying payments every month. The bank would just be drawn against that escrow sure. uh, for the interest only period. And then typically after you refinance, um, a lot of banks, once you're stabilized and you're getting the building going, and typically in year one, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit uh, inconsistent in terms of the cash flow when you're getting the building online, you're stabilizing it. So uh, a lot of times the banks will will give you an interest only period during that kind of mucky period where you're stabilizing it, even if you're paying current at that point, but you got an interest only period, so your payments are lower, you can absorb it with the cash flow that's coming in and starting to trend upwards. And then usually by year two or by year three, uh, a principal and interest uh, payment program will come into play. So that's going to be a more more permanent loan. Correct. Product. Yeah. So if we if we take that equation, right? We've got the interest only loan. We found an asset that needs a little curating. It needs some love, right? Doesn't have a lot of income. We get our IL loan. We fix it up. We now refi. At what point does a cash out refi as a strategy come in? Um, well, you know, for us, every project we looked at, we're like, can we cash out refi once we stabilize? Because usually... In, in and share with us just the advantage, tax yeah. advantage, and the reason why we'd use this as a strategy is we're underwriting a deal three, four, eight years later, whatever it is. Right. Well, one of the reasons why we like to have that healthy spread is that when we do stabilize a project and we refinance it, our goal is to cash out all the equity that was put in the project. So we could pay off our investors or ourselves and reinvest that money, keep it moving. A lot of our projects, because of the spreads, and we've been pretty fortunate in the DC area, we've been able to create a lot of value in these projects. There's been more money on top of the, in the cash out refinances than the equity. So that's, that's tax-free income because it's essentially loan proceeds, but it's baked into the project and your cash flow is servicing that debt. So that money is tax-free. And then you can take those proceeds and, you know, either hold it in reserves or use that to reinvest in other projects as well, which is what we've been doing. Yeah, it's an amazing strategy. And I think anyone who's new to real estate development should really consider that mechanism because, you know, paying taxes obviously removes money from your pocket, from your investor's pocket. Right. And having that strategy baked in with enough spread is really the goal. Right. Um, because like you said, you don't have a taxable event. You can take that proceed whether it's from improving the value, whether it's from appreciation or combination, and then continue that cycle, right? right. Um, so that's pretty cool. And there's a trade-off there because, you know, some may think, oh, I can't believe that money is not taxed. Well, one, it's technically debt, uh, but we get the ability to reinvest that money yeah. into future projects. So everyone really benefits long-term. The community, the cities, uh, the amount of money we pay in fees and construction taxes and, um, you know, income and expense taxes every year, uh, it's it's really expensive, and those are all government taxes. I mean, that's all revenue we're generating for the city. Um, so being able to take that money and reinvest and keep improving neighborhoods, that's the goal, and that's the benefit to being able to take this money and, and put it back out there to work. Yeah, and ultimately what ends up happening is you're increasing the tax base for the city, for the jurisdiction that you're working that's in. That's right. And what ends up happening is that money gets reinvested in infrastructure, in schools, and otherwise. So, yeah, everything. You know, for folks who think, ooh, they're not getting taxed on this, it's getting reinvested into another project, which is further improving the quality of the, right. the neighborhood, 
the community and so forth. Right. And we, we, we take that risk. We take the burden of the risk because we're carrying that as debt. Correct. So yeah. I mean, while your building's being serviced, I mean, there's a catastrophic event in the economy and we're still left holding the bag. So even though it sounds great, it, it is great because it gives some mechanism to grow and keep reinvesting. Um, there's still a lot of risk and burden that we carry as developers. So uh, that's something that, you know, we don't really get pat on the back for, but it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's Definitely. a risk that we have to carry for the life of the project. hundred percent, hundred percent. We got a lot of folks, you know, especially when they're new and they're, they're calling us for advice. They, they maybe saw a property that, Hey, what do you think we can do with this? What's highest and best use? I have a lot of folks asking me, Hey, Sasha, what do you think about a hard money loan, hard money lending? Um, certainly it's a mechanism that can be used. Um, and there's some big drawbacks, but there's some big pluses too. kind of, if you guys want to kind of chime in, what are your thoughts on hard money loan as a strategy, um, both up and downsides? I, I think you probably uh, have a better opinion on that. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's the benefits to it is that you can get money quick through a private lender with less underwriting scrutiny. Um, and uh, it's, it's going to be more project-based and relationship-based than as, as to a bank who's you know, more binary in their approach. You know, get your balance sheet, you get your um, maybe credit, uh, you know, track record, et cetera. Whereas a hard money lender typically will go in knowing, okay, I may have carry some more risk. Worst case, I can take the project. I have the know-how. That's my downfall. Um, and, and it carries an expensive interest rate to it, but you know, you're making it up with the you know, less underwriting standards. So as long as your project can, can carry that note, can carry that interest rate and the, the financing uh, works, then it's a great product to use because of the, you know, the mechanism of getting it's much easier than a bank loan. So it really just depends on, uh, can your project afford it? If your project can afford it and that's your best bet and you can't get a retail loan from the bank, then there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so, so a couple things to note, typically in a hard money loan, you're going to have to pay a couple points or percentages of sure. the total loan it's balance not cheap. It's expensive yeah. on the way in. And you're going to have a pretty high interest rate on the back end. Right. And outside of, you know, a personal guarantee to collateralize that loan, it's typically the project itself that they're going to finance. That's going to be the collateral. Typically that's the main collateral. Yeah. It is a project itself. And the hard money lender knows that. So in order to really consider a hard money loan, the project that you're looking at has to really substantiate the, the balance that you're going to ask for. Absolutely. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. And a lot of times hard money lenders will will uh, carry the interest forward. Okay. So it, it's owed on the back end. So okay. you're not paying it current typically. Yep. And you're not front loading it typically. So you're you're playing principal and interest on the on or sorry, just principal on the way in, is that right? Well, you're just you're getting um, you're going to typically put up the first tranche of money, yep. which could be about 10% to 15% the hard money lender puts up the rest and the interest is just, it's, it's compounding. So it's, it's interest on interest for the life of the loan and it's owed on the back end. So whereas you get flexibility in the front end, you just got to make sure you have a juicy project that you can afford to pay the financing costs in the back when the, when the project comes to fruition, the loan comes due. Makes sense. So yeah. Share with me guys, your thoughts on agency loans, HUD loans, those kinds of things when we're looking at projects. Well, I mean, look, I think the best thing to be looking at right now is just your, your, can you cover that cost? Right. I think right. as, as, as Sunil has kind of alluded to in a, in a couple of the different conversations we've had, it's, it's just about how juicy the product is, right? The project, my bad. Um, and can you, you know, can you pay this back? Right. So it's just always about what is the most smartest thing I can do to add value and not have all this money come out of my pocket, right? It's just the cost of debt. Um, I think sometimes HUD loans make a lot of sense. Sometimes they don't. I think a conventional bank loan with, you know, IO up front makes a lot of sense. Sometimes it doesn't. Hard money. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, right? As, as far as like the terms, um, you know, HUD is a little bit different. Um, Sunil is probably, you know, better at speaking to those terms as well. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's just about looking at the different options that you have in front of you and and realizing what the cost of that debt truly is. So I think what this really boils down to is if you don't have a ton of experience in real estate investing, you need to get aligned with folks who have that intimate operational knowledge 
and the deep Rolodex of you know a plethora of lenders to be able to figure out how do we underwrite this deal, how do we structure the debt, and how do we make sure that you're not in a risky proposition. Yeah, that's right. I mean, when we get into true development projects, and I'm not talking about like single family flips or or you know small two three unit buildings. I mean, those are those are great projects, and you know if the math works, the math works. You know, I always say that like let's does does the math math. Is my saying, right? <laughs> so, you know, if it if the math maths, then it's a great project. But when you start getting the true development plays, which I consider, you know, projects that are, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40,000, 50,000 square feet, you know, tens, 20, 30 units, 40 units plus, 50 units, uh, those are true development plays that require a lot of skill. And they're not something you can just make do trial and error on. You can't just make, can't get in and say, oh, I'll make mistakes, I'll figure it out. You have to have the know-how, the experience of, of navigating a project from A to Z, from the acquisition. You know, we always say the money's made when you buy the land. The acquisition through the entitlement period, getting the permits, knowing how to navigate your, your local jurisdictions, um, and, and then coming up with an efficient project that works uh, and learning and knowing how to maximize that site. Uh, all the while, you are... You know, you've got your debt typically in place when you've purchased the acquisition, or in some case, you buy the land in cash if you have it and you add the debt on later. But if you're an investor, there's nothing better you can do than align yourselves with an operating partner who's been through the gauntlet, who's made mistakes. I would say align us with guys who have made mistakes already. And, you know, even when we interview people that work with us, our team members, we've always said the first question I ask is, Tell me about the mistakes you've made in this business. And if someone says, I haven't made any mistakes, yeah, we won't hire nice. them. Yeah. Because this is a true business. This is the most, you know, uh, most litigious business in the world. And if you haven't made mistakes and you haven't been through it and you haven't come out of the fire, you don't have what it takes to, to make it as a developer or in a development firm. So it's very important to align yourself with the operating partner who has experience and has been through it. And they understand what's around the corner and what are your backup plans. You know, when we pitch investors, the thing I lead off with is, here's your downside. That's the first thing I tell them. Risk first. I do not tell them, oh, we're making this beautiful project and it can be amazing. I don't try to pitch them on a story. I, I don't do that. I just say, hey, look, it's, and maybe it's boring, but I tell them, hey, look, here's your downside. This is our worst case scenario. Um, so if they, they say, okay, great, I'm good with that, then I know we have a winner in terms of a good investor, we're good operating partners, and we'll have a good relationship going forward. I think it's a great, go ahead. Well, I, I was actually gonna speak on that. You know, I think the smart, the successful developers, the successful uh, investors, it's just, it's risk aversion, right? I mean, you have to be looking at the downside more than the upside to really make sure that the pencil, you know, the math maths, as he says, um, how juicy the deal is, right? If we make mistake one, two, or three, you know, are we still going to be able to recoup the cash, right? If, you know, the catastrophic event does happen, what does that look like? You know, how much are we in on this deal? These are the kind of things. And how that, long. And how long, right? Yeah. So again, like, it, yes, it just, it comes back to, debt. It comes back to the timing of the debt. It comes back to the equity. It comes back to different programs that, you know, the city or the fed federal government can help with, um, you know, and the returns of the investors ultimately, but then it comes down to how smart the sponsor is, how smart the operators are, right? How do you keep the costs down? Like, it ties to his experience. And it, and, it, and, it, and it ties to the experience. So, you know, it is, as you said, just like, you know, there are a lot of different intangible things going into a product. But at the end of the day, it's all about risk inversion. Yeah, no banks in a land on a 10, 20, 30 million dollar development or more if the operating partner doesn't have extensive experience. Um, so, you know, people will ask, well, how do you get that extensive experience? Well, actually, you know, you start, like I started flipping houses. Uh, that was kind of like my, I actually started, you know, doing exterior renovations and it morphed into flipping houses. This is like the, we built this city thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, you start small and you really just kind of replicate that over and over and over and you slowly start growing one units turn to three to four units to six to 10 to 15. And then along the way you get experience and people who've grown with you also have money now, hopefully, right? 
at least your generations come up, you people who have the same level of professional experience and they start putting some money in and then those deals grow and then their money grows. And then someone with a lot more money may come around and say, oh, you guys have a great thing going. Um, pitch me, get me on some of your deals. Right. And then you just end up getting bigger. But it takes time. I mean, you know, been at it for from start to now. It's been almost 18 years. Amazing. So, you know, it does take time. It was a 20 year overnight success. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 20 year overnight. <laughs> Actually, you know what? That brings me to a great point. I wanted to really touch on how do we evaluate a property, right? There's like replacement cost, right? There's cash flow, there's comps. I know you've done a, like billions of dollars worth of underwriting and deployment over your career. Pat, share with us, like, how do you determine a property's value? And then what are the different ways to kind of slice that pie? It's a loaded question. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do we have enough time for all of this? Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, honestly, it's it's most most people are looking at it from the cash flow perspective. Um, the big picture is the cost, the cost of the debt, the income, the expenses. Right. That's one way to evaluate it. But you know, I was kind of thinking about this. Property is really only worth what the what the buyer is going to buy. Okay. Right? So even if you come in and or the let's, bank's going to finance, what, what's that? Or the bank, or what or the, the bank is going to finance? finance. Yeah. Like you know, you have you have all of these different you know. Sure, this this is I, my IRR, my cash flow. I'm looking at comps, right? Generally, people are going to get into a project, say. You know, they're going to buy it for a million. They did their underwriting. They want to take it out at one, two. But you know what? The circumstances at this general moment, like this building's worth 900000 right? The way I'm basically finding this out is by looking at all the comps. So you can look at things like replacement cost. You can look at things like comps. You can look at the cash flow, right? All of these different things. You can look at the future value of, of things, um, which is basically, you know, Let's just say <clears throat> there's a property where you can, you know, a, a piece of land where you can say, hey, look, on this land, we know that the land next door is sold for X, Y, and Z amount of money. And you can actually build this much on top of it. And that helps with, you know, the value of, of the building. But, you know, the, the, the highest, the best way to look at it is just highest and best use of the land. You look at zoning. And generally, it's just the comps, right? So it's what another buyer is going to be able to take it down for. And just to add to that, like a development project, we, we're looking at future cash flows and, and what the value of the, of the project will be based on that, on those economics. So that's really how we look at the, you know, the full rehab development plays. Fair. Fair. So let's talk about a couple wins recently. Like, I think you just closed on a pretty cool project today, right? Yeah, I had a pretty cool project on the, um, I guess, kind of smaller-ish side. It was a six unit in the heart of Adams Morgan, historic, a six unit apartment we built with a really cool retail space. We were going to keep it and we had a really cool retail concept, but um, a nonprofit came along and they had a need, part of their initiative. They had money they had to spend. So the economics made sense to, to move on this project. And with what we have in the pipeline, some of the bigger things we're doing in the affordable housing space, we said, okay, this would make sense to unload and, and get off our books, uh, get that cash, rede redeploy it out into some of the larger um, affordable housing projects we're doing. So that, yeah. that, was, that was a nice win. It's a gorgeous property. And I feel a little bit like it's a little bittersweet for me. Really? Because I really like the building and I like the concept we had coming in the retail space. We're going to do an awesome like, pizza and wine bar, but it's okay. It'll, it'll come back around. So that, that was a nice win. And we have a couple of cool wins coming up in some of our future projects that, uh, that'll be really cool. So, and so no, you've had a ton of success with affordable housing plays here in this, in, in like the DC Metro, um, share with us, you know, a couple of those wins. Um, I know that we've got a couple buildings that are coming now for sale, but share with us how that affordable housing lane has been really good to you and your investors. Yeah. So, you know, the beauty of, so Washington, D.C. specifically, and cities like New York, San Francisco, uh, Chicago, Boston, 
um, you name it. These are these are move to work cities. So they the affordable housing programs. Um, they typically affordable housing, what used to be called Section Eight, uh, was really just kind of pigeonholed into certain neighborhoods and cities. And the problem with that was it didn't actually satisfy the goal of affordable housing. The goal of affordable housing is to take to take people who are unfortunate, unfortunately cannot afford to live in any part of the city and give them equitable opportunity to live anywhere they want to live. Um, and, and, you know, just enjoy the opportunities of a neighborhood that hasn't had uh, really a, a lot of the negative history as a lot of, of certain neighborhoods and cities, right? So affordable housing vouchers are, are a great mechanism to in these move to work cities to allow tenants to move anywhere they can. And what the cities do is actually don't cap the rents. They allow the vouchers to match the market rate rents of that specific neighborhood. So in practice, a yeah. family who may not have had access to a specific neighborhood or school system Correct. can now get involved. Correct. There. And that was always the goal from the beginning, but because of government bureaucracy, they were never able to actually catch up to how the market rates trended. So what would happen is, like I mentioned, people would just with vouchers end up back pigeonholed into certain neighborhoods that they wanted to get out of to begin with. So whether they wanted safer neighborhoods and, you know, equitable distribution of housing is what, in my opinion, creates a safer uh, city. Uh, it creates economic diversity, socioeconomic diversity, um, and a more prosperous city overall. So when you- attack on? Also, yeah. generational opportunity. You can Absolutely. build a different network that you would maybe not have had access to Absolutely. because you're able to now live in this neighborhood that otherwise you wouldn't have been able to afford. hundred sure. percent. So what we've been, what we've done is, you know, because the city, they, they incentivize us operationally uh, to, to create projects that are directed towards affordable uh, tenants. So we, we've done as we made a model out of it. We said, you know what, let us, instead of having a building that's just, you know, partially, or some of our buildings are partially affordable, partially market, we've done some projects as complete affordable. And working with the city, we've, you know, uh, had some really nice projects in great neighborhoods and uh, that have allowed residents to take advantage of some of the opportunities that these neighborhoods provide. And it's something as simple as like, oh, I'm closer to my job now. I can take a quick five minute bus or I can walk. Spend more time with the kids as a Spend result. Spend more time with the kids or just better quality of life. Yeah. Whereas I used to you know, have to track two hours across the city just to get to work on a bus or three buses. And now I have to do that to get back home. And now there are residents who are like, you know, we had one, we had a veteran. And I remember this story because he wrote an email to our property management division. And uh, I'll leave his name out, but I still remember his name. And he said, um, you know, thank you for awarding me this opportunity to live in this neighborhood, I used to live in a neighborhood where bullet holes were, were standard in my windows or doors. And now I live in the best neighborhood I ever have in my life. I can go on walks and I feel safe. I can enjoy my, you know, I'm a senior and I'm a veteran. I can enjoy my latter years in, in peace. And I can walk to the grocery store. I couldn't do that before. Amazing. Um, so these are small wins. Uh, and I, ha I have to commend the city too, because the city like DC has done a great job in creating really good, robust, affordable programs that are, I don't want to say developer friendly, but they allow us to navigate the programs with them so we can create good housing. And, and our quality of product is the same, just because some, someone may think it's affordable that, you know, maybe you skimp on the quality. No, we do condo quality finish, uh, durable product for all of our projects, affordable or not. So uh, it gives us the ability to do that. And, um, you know, I have to commend everyone from the city and obviously our team to, to not being able to navigate this. Let me get on my pulpit for a moment. Yeah. For all of those of you who want to poo-poo developers and talk about the big, <laughs> bad developers, yeah. about how we're gentrifying cities, the truth is that this is economic development that benefits everyone. It increases the tax base. It gives opportunities to folks who wouldn't have had it otherwise. And by increasing that tax base, you'd have more money to fund after school programs, infrastructure, education, public transit, you name it. So stop poo-pooing developers. <laughs> Get out of my face with that shit. Excuse my language. Sorry, guys. I, I, it's something that I'm And then look, to, to that point, uh, you bring up an interesting topic. Like they're, they're, they're developers who have, have no- Ethics. Ethics and no worry. Of course, it's in every industry though. 
let's not get it twisted. It's not exclusive to developers only. Uh, but you know, if it wasn't for development projects, if it wasn't for neighborhoods changing the landscape and, and evolving with the times, there is no money for anything. Correct. And that's where it comes from. But what is good for, you know, what's something great that DC has done is they're attaching affordable requirements to some of these projects, a lot of them that are making us or, or making developers from the onset have to diversify the income levels of the housing, which is great for the neighborhood because then you're able to, to you know, um, diversify the housing. When you diversify housing, tenant bases, you know, uh, the, the socioeconomics of neighborhoods, that's again, when you have equitable opportunities that are fair for everybody. And that's how neighborhoods stay diverse. That's how they grow. That's how everyone has a fair shot at life. Um, and I think, you know, as cities jump on this and do more and more affordable housing components with development projects, we will see more of this. Um, and it'll catch up once the governments are able to get through a lot of the red tape and can catch up with the private sector. We, we will look back in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, we'll say the things we did now, which had a lot of heat, um, really did work. And I truly think that. Uh, but, you know, as Steve Jobs said, you have to, you can only connect the dots looking back. Makes sense. Makes sense. Look, I, I appreciate you taking the time, both of you today, to shine some light on you know, the effects of development in the city. Um, also kind of how to structure deals, what to look at, how to uh, align yourself with the right team, with the right lenders, with the right organizations. And it's great to give a bit of a look behind the curtain for the general public or for those who are interested in real, real estate investment who may not have had um, access. Um, so thank you both for taking the time today. Of course. Um, and frankly, that's all we've got for today's crew show. Check in next time. Thanks. One street.